Uh, welcome. And just sort of by a raise of hands, um, who knows about big data? Who knows what is big data? <laughs> a few brave souls. Uh, who knows a little bit about uh, agency oversight? Oh. Are you guys sure you're in the right room? <laughs> well, uh, welcome. Good morning to you all. I'm GP. Uh, I've uh, worked in the oversight and transparency business, uh, having worked as a program manager on recovery.gov. Uh, very excited to uh, have you here and talk about how big data technologies are changing, how organizations do oversight, uh, financial management, uh, drive innovation, look at different types of interesting uh, performance metrics. And I think um, one of the unique things we've done on this panel is brought you a tremendous amount of expertise um, and experience uh, of people that are just not talking about big data, but actually are doing it. Uh, let me just quickly introduce uh, my panel. Uh, I have uh, Chairman uh, Errol Devaney, uh, who was the founding chair of the Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board. Uh, probably does not need an introduction, has spent over 40 years in federal service. Uh, one of the interesting things about him is a big proponent of driving change using technology. Uh, next to him is uh, Honorable David Williams, the Inspector General with the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, for those of you that are interested in numbers, since this is a data-oriented track, uh, the United States Postal Service is a $65 billion revenue organization, and Mr. Williams reads a staff of about 1,000 plus people uh, trying to sort of uh, do oversight of this gigantic organization. Uh, next to him is Ms. Ho. Uh, Christina Ho is um, the Assistant Commissioner for Government Wide Accounting at the Department of the Treasury. She has some really interesting initiatives going on. Uh, one of them is USAspending.gov. Um, what's also interesting is they're starting to look at a lot of uh, initiatives from both the ground up and sort of legacy construct that they've received. So a lot of talk around uh, data quality and so, you know, with big data, uh, big data quality doesn't go away. Um, and then next to her is, we're delighted to have um, Mary Davis from GSA. She'll be talking to you about how she is um, innovating and using technologies in the big data space to improve the procurement process. So again, I won't read through the detailed bios. Uh, very excited to have you. Uh, my instructions are to make this interactive. So if you don't ask questions, I'll put you on the spot and ask you questions. No, I'm kidding. Um, so with that, I'd like to start, kick off the panel. Uh, Mary, why don't you go ahead and give the audience a feel for uh, what's your take on big data and how you're innovating and uh, driving mission performance. Okay, thank you. Um, so I work for the Federal Acquisition Service and GSA, and about $56 billion of agency spend comes through FAS through a variety of our programs. Uh, and that's everything from the travel and auto, uh, travel fleet and automotive supply program, office supplies, my area, of course, IT and telecommunications, um, assisted services. <clears throat> so a lot of agency spend flows through GSA, and as many of, um, contrary to popular belief of some of our agencies, we don't actually oversee uh, any other agency um, buying or try to oversee, but what we are trying to do in FAS and really across GSA because of the, I would guess, millions of transactions that that $56 billion constitutes, whether it's GSA's buys on behalf of other agencies or agency buys through GSA contracts and solutions, there's a huge opportunity for GSA to collect data on what's being purchased and provide that to the agencies, and in some cases to industry, on what is being purchased who's buying it, how much are they paying for it, down to the line item level. And we've got varying degrees of data on each of those programs. In some cases, we can tell you by line item what's been purchased, how much has that cost. And we make that available to the agencies, which, and I'll give some examples later, really helps not only drive prices down, which of course is you know a government entity, that's what we're interested in, but also around you know what is being purchased. Um, who are we buying it from? What are the best ways to purchase some of these things? So a huge opportunity there. GSA also, of course, runs data.gov, 100,000 data sets available there. Um, Dave McClure's group, who he happens to be in the room, which is good, because if there's any questions around that, he can answer them. Um, oversees that 
uh, that uh, that site and, and that um, that capability. <coughs> so you know, just across GSA, we have and will have. Uh, there's really sort of a um, a big uh, focus right now from Dan Tangerlini and Tom Sharp on what GSA can do to turn ourselves into sort of this almost a selling entity where we make um, opportunities available for industry to sell to government into a buying entity. What can we do to make government a better buyer? What can we provide to agencies in terms of not just data and information, but solutions available to help government become a better buyer? So we're sort of flipping um, our focus and our model from a selling platform into a buying platform, and I'll talk more about that. Thanks, Mary, for sharing us uh, with us that insight. Christina, do you want to talk about what you're doing at Bureau of the Fiscal Service around data, data standardization, big data, and all the other payment transparency? Sure. Um, currently, my organization is responsible for Do I need to repeat all that? <laughs> um, this call actually has been getting quite a lot of uh, popularity in the different transparency websites out there, including some of the state. Um, it says, we might hope to see the finances of the union as clear and intelligible as a merchant's books so that every member of Congress and every man of any kind in the union should be able to comprehend them, to investigate abuses, and consequently to control them. And this was back in 1802. And I would say that we're not anywhere near um, <laughs> that. Um, this quote was uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, said this to his Secretary of Treasury at the time because um, Secretary Gallatin was the first person who really focused on documenting all the expenditures in a way so that people can understand them. Um, but I think from this quote, um, if you dissect it a little bit, that transparency is not a new concept, clearly. And the, the definition, the, what, what transparency about is not just about providing information, but providing meaningful information so that it could be used and understood. Um, so er, this morning I enjoy listening to, to the presidential fellow and many people mentioned open data. Uh, I was at an international conference recently with other countries to talk about financial management and I spoke on uh, transparency. Um, open data was a global, clearly because of the G8 summit charter, open data charter, there's a global trend on, on transparency. Every countries were, you know, most countries were struggling with that. Uh, I know multiple, UK, Canada, they all have transparency initiative. Um, one of the open charter mentioned that all uh, country wanted to publish high value data and financial spending data is considered high value data. So um, coincidentally, the vision I mentioned earlier uh, toward the end of last year, that as we think about from a financial reporting perspective and the data we had, we came up with a, a, a vision that we are very, very excited about. And, um, and our vision is about, I, I have to read it because um, it's a bit, um, I don't want to misquote it. So our vision, treasury vision, provide reliable, timely and secure uh, intelligent data for the purpose of promoting transparency, facilitating better decision making, and improving operational efficiency. We, we want to provide not just data, but data with context, which means 
that would be meaningful information. You can have a lot of data in the whole big, big data initiative, figuring out how to in, 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 uh, do analytics. Our focus, at least right now, is about providing access to the data and not just, uh, and, and the government has a lot of data and how do we um, provide that access so that um, they can be consumed uh, whenever and ever, wherever uh, people would like. That's uh, what we're currently working on. And GP mentioned USA spending. We're also um, Treasury as part of the um, President's budget passback um, is um, being asked to take over USA spending and we're working on that. We understand um, the data quality challenge. We also understand the usability, consumability challenge and we, wa we want to um, collaborate and link what we're working on to make sure, you know, with the future vision um, in mind. So that's what we're working on and we can, you know, I'm well open to any questions. Thank you, Christina. For the folks that are standing on the side of the room, there is a chair from there that you might have come Thank you, Christina, for sharing that perspective. I want to introduce you to um, Mr. Williams. Uh, you've worked a lot on you know, different uh, big data initiatives, and what I find interesting is, as part of the GADB activities, I think you're sort of driving some interesting, innovative uh, lessons learned, I think, from the, the, the experience in the last couple of years. Please do give us a perspective on you know, some of the things that you're working on and how you sort of see big data driving your mission. Thanks, JP. We're pretty good candidates for big data. We have about a half a million employees at the Postal Service. And um, we collect 65 billion a year. We spend 65 billion or more a year, unfortunately. <laughs> we have, it's not that funny, everybody. <laughs> we, um, we handle 160 billion pieces of mail in a growing area of parcels personal correspondence falling. So there's a lot going on, a lot of data. Um, we take a pretty practical approach to data analytics and to big data. We're, we're not uh, digital fashionist, uh, fashionistas by any stretch. If our models don't very quickly result in somebody being thrown face down on the sidewalk and put in handcuffs, the investigators get bored and leave. So that's, that's our market, that's our customers, and when they're gone, there's really not a reason to have, to have them. Having said that, we have a large investment, and it's a growing investment in the area of data analytics and, uh, and large data. We're confident in the area of investigations. It's made the investigations faster, richer, and it preserves the investigator's very favorite element in the entire um, periodic chart of basic elements, the element of surprise. They, just, they love surprising people and the, the models allow that to happen. We're growing increasingly reliant on these models. The auditors have a suite uh, called Paris, Performance and Results Information Systems, and they have a, they have a model for each of the major postal uh, programs. The investigators use a suite of tools called radar, and there's a subset of those uh, called tripwires that are constantly patrolling for uh, narrow, narrowly focused on crimes in progress. And, and those work well. You know what a tripwire is, don't you? <laughs> yeah, no, but we would love that. <laughs> we have about 1,200 people. About 300 of them are heavy users of these. They, they check in, they integrate them into audits and investigations and, and use them with some regularity. Last year, we opened about 200 of our investigations based on, uh, based on these leads. We recovered about $30 million uh, based on, on digital leads. And at any given moment, we have about 30 of our models running at the same time. All the results are not financial. Some of them make audits richer or more compelling. Um, as I said, we have a Paris model for each of the large programs for um, a delivery, mail delivery, uh, the network processing plants, um, the post offices, uh, and, and all the others. Uh, across the top of the, the matrix of, uh, of Paris models, we have uh, the program's health signs, 
performance and customer service level, legal compliance, and the control environment. And then down the side we have metrics, the metrics that have been set up for the programs, and goals. Sometimes you know exactly what an optimal performance is, and other times it's, it's relative to the other to the other elements of the organization, the other postal plants, the other regions. So they're sort of placed against each other. These models are looking for poor performance or for excellent performance. And um, they, they also allow, once you find poor performance, they allow for diagnostics so you can find out what it is that caused it and what a get well plan would look like. In the case of excellence, what caused the breakthrough to occur so that we can spread it across the organization. Um, <coughs> Paris searches for excellence. Radar searches for misconduct and, un, and hidden risks. So they're mirrored images of one another. The longer we work with these, the more we're beginning to suspect and begin to take on the idea of moving them into a single suite that produces uh, different user reports. And that, that's, that's one of the lessons learned so far that we, we believe we have